Welcome to the Natasha Helfer Podcast. To help keep this podcast going, please consider donating at natashahelfer.com and share this episode. To watch the video of this podcast, you can subscribe to Natasha's channel on YouTube and follow her professional Facebook page at Natasha Helfer, LCMFT, CST-S. You can find all her cool resources at natashahelfer.com. The intro and outro music for these episodes are by Otter Creek. I'm Natasha Helfer. I'm a relational and sex therapist, and this is my podcast where we try to attack shame and all kinds of other naughty things and get healthier through education, stories, and relationships. And I am just thrilled to have two people here with me today, Jane Christie and Sarah Elizabeth Delaney. And they are coming to us from the UK, and they're going to tell us all about this amazing grassroots effort that has been happening kind of under <laughs> under the rug, I guess. Or like, and then all of a sudden we find out that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is going to require background checks in the UK, which is kind of unheard of. They don't do that here in the United States. And this is all because of these two lovely women, as well as I'm sure the efforts of many others that were part of this. So we're here to have them tell the story. And I'm going to just have you both introduce yourselves. I know you sent me a little lovely bio, but I always love hearing more from you about you than me talking about you. So Jane, <laughs> why, Jane why don't you get started? And then we'll give Sarah yeah. a chance to introduce herself. Yes. Sounds good. Okay. So I am a member of the church still. I am I am engaged. Um, I was a teen convert. Uh, over here in Scotland, so I I live uh, just outside Glasgow, and we have we have a lovely ward here in Scotland. I think in the whole United Kingdom, you have to really really want to be Mormon. <laughs> you know, it's you it's very um, family community uh, orientated, but obviously with that comes kind of being a little bit insular. So when we talk about the Mormon bubble. I th- I think we kind of have to live in that a little bit here just in order to survive. So it's not always a bad thing, <laughs> but often it is. Um, so yeah, I've served throughout the church, uh, young women's president, uh, counselor and relief society, youth Sunday school, all of those kinds of things. I guess the the main parts about my uh, background would be I... I'm married to a non-member who thinks we're all completely back crap crazy, who is fantastic. He um he's been making Book of Mormon musical style jokes about my life for the past however long. So um yeah, he's really funny. We did an I'm a Mormon video as a family. My whole family hated me for it. Uh, I made them smile. And uh, so our family was on the side of the double decker buses in London and on the Jumbotron. And uh, my non member husband would get recognized in the street, which gave me life. This, <laughs> oh, you're that Mormon guy. It was superb. Uh, we still milk that today. What else? Um, I, and yeah, I can't physically get to church anymore because I have a a 24 year old, my middle son is 24 years old and he has uh, complex learning difficulties and he can't leave the house anymore or he doesn't leave the house anymore. And it's really tough for him. Church um, at one point was incredible for him, but church doesn't cater to his needs and is unable to cater to his needs because we are so small, there just aren't enough people. So, uh, yeah, I I church from home at a distance. Uh, I'm still super engaged in it. And all of my friends left left the church or were leaving the church. I've been super nuanced for like 15 years. And I got so frustrated that my friends were all leaving the church uh, that we would go out into the foyer and have these incredibly rich and meaningful conversations that I would be so excited by like, oh my goodness, look at all these people coming into the, this nuanced space. This is exciting. A primary uh, primary teacher who had just, she just wasn't long out of serving, at, of graduating out of the youth program. 
and she's called as primary president. And do you remember that really bad inside uh, friend article from like several years ago where it was slut shaming the girl's outfit and stuff? It was around about then. And they're doing this, this lesson all about my body and uh, all of this shaming. And she's like, I just, I just can't with this, with this topic, this one. And, uh, and, and I'm like, well, what are you going to do? I'm just not going to teach it. And I thought, yes, this is it. We're here. We've arrived. And then they all left. So we started a podcast uh, with my, my friend and I to talk about the tough stuff and uh, really really quickly as soon as you start talking about this tough stuff people start talking about all of their pain they bring it all and so abuse was one of those subjects I got to go hang out at Sunstone meet the rest of the people who podcast in the UK as uh who are lovingly and ridiculously referred to as the Brit Avengers so we've got like a little gang and that was where I met my dear one my beloved show business and podcasting wife <laughs> Sarah <laughs> Delaney <laughs> yeah so that's my background and that's up to where I met I met my girl oh I okay. love it Sarah, tell us about you. And, and well, and, and your podcast is called 21st Century Saints, Saints correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We wanted to talk about how to Mormon. Yeah, yeah. We are, Ten, we are in the 21st century, century people. We can do things a little bit, you know, differently here. Yeah. So, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. 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 Natasha, thank you for having us here. It's fabulous. And it's really good to be here with my podcasting wife as we lovingly like to think of ourselves I joined the church in my early 20s along with my husband who and he was the one that was really keen to join the church and I kind of followed him not really sure that I was that interested in this to be honest with you but just followed him we stayed in the church he actually went less active after we'd been members of the church for about 10-15 years because he found a lot of things that he thought actually I don't think I believe that anymore I don't think that's right so he, le he left the church then Years later, gradually all my teenage children left the church, one after the other, all around about 16, 17 years old. And they all left and just said, this just is not for us. This is not what we see. We don't believe this. We don't like what we see. There's lots we're not happy with. And that they all left. And I was kind of the one and only member of my church and stayed active. I'm still an active member of the church, actively engaged very nuanced very nuanced but actively engaged concerned about the number of people that are leaving concerned about the things that could be so much better if we many many callings really primary young women it's all the kind of mormony stuff that you do as you go through the church professionally i've been a qualified probation officer social worker for numerous many 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 years and for about 25 30 years worked exclusively in the field of sexual harm both with victims of sexual harm and then for about the last 25 years with perpetrators of sexual harm and that included the last 15 17 years of my working life I was working with children and young people between the ages of and we're dealing with significant amounts of trauma as well as high levels of risk that kind of intersection of risk trauma harm over many, many years about how we weren't teaching healthy, appropriate messages. We were teaching abstinence around sex to youth, but we weren't talking about consent and healthy relationships. We were teaching primary children their bodies with temples and cover up those porn shoulders, but we weren't talking to them about OK touch and safe touch. Yeah, so the internet has been so bad in Sarah's yeah. area for, for this past few days, so I'm I'm really sorry. Um, I'm fine at some okay. stage. <clears throat> And we were talking about safeguarding concerns and we felt that the concerns were such that neither of us had had any success with engaging with leaders that were willing to listen to us and give any kind of response other than the priesthood have got this, you can just leave it now, it's, leave it alone, the priesthood will deal with it. And we felt that the priesthood weren't dealing with it and things had to change. So we jumped on the podcast and jumped on discussions aimed at bringing about significant change okay so a few things just to kind of clarify for people who are listening we are talking about the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints which is also kind of colloquially known as the mormon church the mainstream mormon church and so that's the that's the religious entity that we're addressing and also for those i think most people who listen to this podcast are probably in the united states and 
I don't want to make any assumptions about geographical intelligence, but the United Kingdom <laughs> does include England and Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. Yes. So that this is yeah. the, the, the entities we are discussing in regards to kind of this grassroots movement that has happened in the UK and it's affected these particular countries um, yeah. is my understanding. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so let's get started with just kind of the story. How does the story begin? I mean, obviously, Sarah, you're talking about, you know, your interest professionally, you know, and Jane, you're talking about a lot of your interests, of course, personally and kind of with your own family issues. This gets personal and professional really quick, right? I mean, I was in that. It does, yeah in that role as well as a therapist, but also as a church goer and seeing so many stories and hearing so many stories from our members and, um, and also from my clients. So where does this story begin for the two of you? I think it's helpful if we give an outline that the concerns we had around safeguarding within the church in the UK, where the, all the UK safeguarding experts and the UK government had recommendations and standards that they expected organisations to follow around safeguarding. Churches were put in this position where they were given the option to voluntarily adopt, adopt this code of practice. Yeah. And a lot of churches in the UK have done that. Most, most faith communities in the UK did adopt that and have followed the code of practice and have followed the standards that were set. But our church struggled to understand the importance and the need for that. And we had significant concerns that they were not undertaking background checks, which in the UK is the norm. It's absolutely par for the course. If you work with children or vulnerable people, that a background check is undertaken. But the church was struggling to understand the importance and the benefit of that. And there was concerns that training wasn't adequate enough to equip bishops and state presidents and leaders and anyone serving in the church with the range of depth of understanding that they needed to be able to respond appropriately to abuse or concerns around abuse. And that we had a culture where abuse wasn't discussed in healthy, positive terms that would enable people to have a language to talk about things they were worried about. So we kind of had all those concerns that we wanted to bring to the table to say, can we start discussing this? Can we talk with you as church leaders and make some recommendations for how we can move forward and get this church into a much, much better position around safeguarding? And that's where it started and hugely built on the back of stories of victims, people that had spoken to us about their experiences. Some of those stories are yet to be told and yet to come to the forefront, but hugely built on the stories and experiences of people that we knew and loved and cared about. And we just felt that we could we could encourage the church and work with the church to adopt standards and practices that would be the best possible way of operating in this country. And that's what we set out to do. And well, it's had twists just, and turns along the yeah, way. Yeah. And just to be clear, I, I want to say that that's actually the best standards of, of treatment here in the United States as well is to have a background check. So it isn't. Yeah, it isn't like it shouldn't be foreign <laughs> to our church leaders who are primarily based here in the United States and Utah based this idea of background checks right and so I would I would also say that most of the organizations here in the United States are also practicing background checks so just want to make sure that people understand this is not like a UK only <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. yeah so I I think I think for me where where I would probably begin how 21st century saints because because at the moment I think the story looks very much like other people's stories who have tried to talk about abuse in the church before over a period of not just many years but you know since the inception of the church people have talked about problematic behavior that would fall under the heading of safeguarding Sarah because she has this professional background brought us a new language we weren't talking about safeguarding um until very recently so safeguarding is about not just child protection not just background checks for people working with children it's about all aspects of the vulnerable in our communities 
So the UN describes vulnerable groups as um, LGBTQ people, uh, people from uh, who have African descent, uh, people from traveling communities, women. The, the, it's really quite a large group. And when it comes to um, adult abuse cases, uh, people over the age of 65 are the most uh, common um, vulnerable demographic. So, you know, whenever we think in terms of having bishops interviews and tithing settlement or conversations around uh, serving a senior mission um how how vulnerable are we to uh, in those conversations with elderly parents who are making key financial decisions and being guided by someone who they see as an authority figure so th there is a huge huge scope here and for us it, it kind of we're not just talking about sort of professionally but um we, well we kind of are so background checks in the UK are always done with consent. Someone knows it's it's um it's happening. We take part in the process. Um, it's key pieces of information. Um, but we were always very very clear that background checks, while they are ubiquitous here, most jobs will require them if there's some type of public facing work, no matter how simple that is. Um. Our, this this story isn't just about background checks. They they play a tiny, tiny part, now a very important part. But our story, I guess, really begins with, with one individual that when a case was being discussed in Scotland that was intersecting with Mormonism, uh, we saw a response within the Mormon community that kind of reached out across the world. And we saw people who had either decided to take the victim's side or the person who was making the claims uh, decided to take their side or decided uh, to take uh, the uh, alleged abuser's side. And there was no in between. And it was almost sort of, it, it played out in such harmful ways between, it wasn't even Mormon, ex-Mormon. It was, I believe you, I don't believe you. It was so worrying to us seeing how these conversations were unfolding, particularly online in the comments of newspaper articles where we would actually see people trying to defend parenting styles, advocating for children should be beaten by their, child, by their parents. You know, the things that were really harmful and unhealthy we wanted to talk about it on the podcast and when we wanted to talk about the subject of abuse in the church and parenting and specifically child uh, child sexual abuse all of the different faces of abuse because how can we talk about it if we can't recognize what it is we were we someone offered someone threatened to sue us just for having a conversation uh, uh, people were telling us very clearly that we should not even be talking about this. And for a few weeks, we were really rattled. We, we, we kind of thought, okay, if this is going to cause pain on this level and if there's potential legal action for, but how does that work from just having a conversation? And then we realized that you do not get to tell us what to do. The, the levels of fear and silencing were so extreme that it's that action that caused us to speak out louder. The victims involved in that case have not fully told their story. They've not even sort of scratched the surface of that story. So we're really aware that this is this is something that's out there. And that people looking at how that was being discussed would find significant barriers into coming forward with their own experiences of abuse if they have experienced that. People in your ward are watching how you are responding to the subject of abuse. And if it seems that this is not a safe place to talk about it, then they're not going to disclose. So this was an action to help victims feel like they could raise their voices and that we could, um, using Sarah's incredible expertise start to bring a, a vocabulary a language of how we speak about these things we're very clear that church leaders believe absolutely that the standards that we had at that time for how we treat um allegations of abuse within the church the, the church really believe and the leaders did that this was this was great. We now have online training. There's now a two-deep policy. And so what we did was we we broke down 
all of the problems with that, you know, that um, the online training uh, doesn't allow you to look at your own biases. It's a cartoon. It minimizes the subject of abuse. It doesn't allow us to ask questions. It doesn't allow us to, to really deeply understand um, what proper safeguarding should look like. So we broke things like that down. Um, we were hearing a lot from members that they believe the church will make changes when the prophet tells them to. When the Lord tells the prophet, that's when the changes will happen. And so without that, we shouldn't act. And of course, our point is that, well, if you believe in Revelation, then that's kind of how it works. Uh, we are a church that counsel and, you know, and, 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 uh, community with each other and conference with each other that's why we're constantly having meeting after meeting about things um so we can bring this to your attention people experts over the world have been telling you for years and years this is a problem for a teacher to go to work and have certain professional standards then to walk back into church where those standards are not being reflected it was so worrying that we were seeing the illusion of safeguarding. And when that illusion is being presented to you, when you feel that safe because the church has everything under control, that's when we're at greatest risk of abuse. So that's what that's what sort of that's where we where we began the journey. Yeah. So a, a few things. Can you explain who we is, right? Because you're talking about yeah. that, right? So kind of like who sure. are the people? Yeah. Who were the people that were kind of like on board with you? And and not that you have to name names necessarily, but in general, kind of like and um, or you can name names too if you want. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, and then I'd also like for you to maybe go into a little bit of what you saw the differences, right? Because you're making a lot of statements around like the church's way of trying to safeguard. Mm -hmm is kind of like you know your government and kind of legal entities and and things like that 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 have safeguards that are usually pretty robust i mean i'm i'm, I'm assuming they're similar to here in the united states where we have very robust kind of yeah. uh, tra trauma informed and like uh, abuse informed and uh, predator informed and all those kinds of of informed entities trying to come up with the overall guidelines but yes i i agree with you i think the church in general thinks that their system is best for for themselves kind of like an in in-house system of how they have yes. decided to deal with abuse and and what to do when it comes up so anyway that's a lot but if you can start with maybe yeah yeah sure we and what are the differences so we so 21st century saints began with uh, me and my colleague Alana who has graduated out of this Mormon space uh she's incredible and we wouldn't be doing this work without her so yeah Alana's out there in the ether living her best post-Mormon life we now have Sarah with us we also now have Ruth Heath who is a post-Mormon also and brings this incredible perspective these are very very smart women uh, but in addition to that, and um, because we're in the UK and uh, it's it, it was a teasing nickname that kind of stuck. So the Brit Vengers, the British podcasters who are sort of in this space. So we have Priesthood Dispatches, Nemo the Mormon, Peter Bleakley, uh, Laura and Julian Heath who kind of run with it. We're, we're running with UK Sunstone. And we all just became really, really good friends. Now, for example, PD. Uh, priesthood dispatches he he is a survivor so his story was uh part of what shaped the type of work we were doing we, we could see how things were being handled as he reported we could see some of the problem areas and we learned a lot from that so his story was pivotal but also he 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 broadcasts stuff about you know sort of ex-mormon really fringy has a level of humor that makes me I, like I, I will just faint one of these days because he he goes for the jugular um we all have such different perspectives um peter's been excommunicated Nemo, I think people just keep wondering why Nemo hasn't been excommunicated, but he's he's so sweet and adorable and he just, you know, has his little accent thing going on. And so everyone just loves his work. So we are this tight little group who um, talk about everything. We asked for a bit of their support as we were we So one of the things that we did on on this safeguarding journey was we 
were very aware that what the church were portraying and the church really really believed as good safeguarding they've given this a lot of thought and you know as we say these new policies had come into place there were issues so I think the the really important thing that had happened was there was a, a really high profile um, abuse scandal that affected the BBC, uh, the, the national sort of broadcaster, um, along with lots of high profile charities. And it was all linked by the same individual who had easy access to, to children, to vulnerable children. And because of the scale of this, the government launched an inquiry and from that inquiry, churches, organisations were asked to participate, um, share what you are learning as part of this process. And the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the United Kingdom gave testimony to that inquiry. We were really surprised when we read the testimony from the church lawyer who had indicated that the, the numbers that were reported in the church not only were they very low, but, you know, if we, if we just look at statistics, they are impossibly low. They There would have to be something pretty incredible that's happening within the church for them to be that low. Um, so we were kind of concerned because it wasn't reflecting what we had already heard. We, we've we looked at over 100 cases. We've heard from over 100 people. Um, the number 12 <laughs> is uh, is you know, over a period of what, 10 years, I think he was, he was testifying about, um, was really, it, it didn't make sense to us. So as we were looking at um, those recommendations from the inquiry, things were being suggested that organisations and churches could do now to, uh, to uh, what would look like best practice of safeguarding. Um, and, and we were really excited because we kind of thought, well, if, all of these recommendations are just coming out and the church were to implement these, then the church actually really could be what it, it believes it is at the moment and could be a world leader in safeguarding. That's entirely possible. So we wanted to present what we had learned. We were asked to speak to a national inquiry. We were concerned that the testimony that had been provided to the inquiry um, made it really clear that the church's processes are that bishops are responsible for safeguarding in their ward and the, and which makes sense right and the, at a stake level it's state presidents who are responsible for safeguarding except if a bishop were to call someone to a position in the church and that person was on the barred list the 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 sex offenders register with a specific list of people who who cannot work with children if a bishop knowingly did that they would be liable for prosecution so we contacted every bishop by letter in the united kingdom letting the letting them know <laughs> that um you're probably not aware of this but here is what you need to know and here's where you can find this guidance online it it rattled people the the you know we we did get a stern letter from the church lawyers who were i think a bit dismayed that that we had taken that action but we we keep offering the same information. This is what good practice looks like. We are neither here to uh, blow smoke up your asses to tell you how fantastic you are, um, but nor are we here to sort of get in the way. We want to show you what we're learning. We want to tell you what best practice is. We are members of the church. We love this church. This is how we can be better. And would you take these recommendations forward? So from there, a safeguarding committee was set up. So we have the Brit Vengers. We have us as 21st century saints are probably the most, I mean, we're definitely not TBM or sort of this true believing Mormon, super conservative type of Latter-day Saints, but we're probably as close in the group to it as, as, uh, as we can get. We, <laughs> there's us, there's the broader group of fringy Brit Vengers, and then there are all of the um, leaders, lawyers that we're working with. They are the victims whose voices just keep on, uh, their stories are, are becoming more and more powerful at the, with the numbers who are approaching us. Because of course, if you start talking about abuse, people then start disclosing. We then have um, 
on our website, we published a, an open letter. We asked for podcasters, um, uh, broadcasters, uh, people who were interested in the Mormon spectrum. We asked everyone to co-sign this letter. So we had um, you, Natasha, you, you said yes as soon as we asked. Uh, your name's on the open letter. We also have uh, people like Radio Free Mormon, Bill Real, um, Mormon Stories, uh, Lindsay Hanson Park. So we, we have all of the, it, it's almost, it, it, I, I'm going to use the, the language of sort of faithful Mormonism that, it, you know, in a lot of ways it, it felt miraculous to us that it's so rare that in Mormon history we have seen all of these people who are faithful, who are leaders, who are dissident, who are fringy, who have left people who would happily see the church burn down. We're seeing everyone standing in the same place and they're saying, we need to do better. We need to look at safeguarding and we need to make it better. And it was tough, I think, for you know our church leaders to hear how we were phrasing that, but it made the difference because we had good leaders who listened to us in this area. And uh, they set up a safeguarding committee. And so Sarah and I were, were rejoicing. Uh, we were also furious uh, because let's face it, in church history, when have women especially, but when does the church establish a committee to look at something like this? This hasn't happened before. And I was sort of saying to Sarah, your expertise has brought us to this place where there's now a committee and I and I was furious because the committee um started in January and oh I, I just had visions of it sort of sitting for years debating and discussing while we were like you could do this right now a freaking committee come on this is obvious stuff the committee however were meeting tirelessly working constantly and they brought these recommendations and what I believe in this space is it's record time while we have a long long way to go one of the measures that's been brought in is background checks DBS checks there's also going to be safeguarding specialists called in every stake Sarah has already been called and set apart as the the first the first uh, safeguarding uh, state safeguarding specialist in the UK. Nemo the Mormon was was part of setting her apart and getting to exercise his priesthood and and you know sort of being there in support and friendship and love and and what a wonderful thing to be able to do and I feel like this is a moment that is worth celebrating because it shows that we don't have to be afraid of these dissident voices. What would the church look like if we had that, if we had Nemo the Mormon exercising his priesthood yet still could say uh, things that worried him or concerned him about the church? What would happen if Peter hadn't been excommunicated, if our Natasha hadn't been excommunicated? And so that was a real worry to us right through this journey as we as we're looking back and we're thinking about the there's a real risk to membership if if you speak out if we are sort of challenging or confronting behaviors or attitudes or responses that that are harmful if you don't see it and we're telling you that yes it's a problem we know what the risk is because we were with you in spirit when you did that on behalf of your clients and for um you know for for how the church was harming members by not being able to have healthy attitudes around bodies and sexual shaming and and all of those things so we found real strength in looking at the women who had been in this space before us and had been excommunicated and as we uh, spent time sort of gaining, trying to gain strength, trying to uh, look at how we were going to approach things, frequently we sort of referred back to, you know, remember remember when, Sa when, when Natasha just needed her women? Do you remember that, Sarah, when, you know, in, in that, that healing space? We need our women. So, so we, we had lots yeah. and lots of healing time and uh, you were definitely with us in spirit. So we just want oh, to thank wow. you because we learned a lot from, from what had happened. Thank you. That's 
that's quite an honor for you to even just bring all that up. Sarah, Sarah just kind of comes yeah. in. Yeah. I'm going to, if, if we don't get Sarah's story, I'm going to figure out a time when we get better internet. And oh my God. She is that good. <laughs> People, her story is worth listening to. Do you know, and, and just to, just to sort of speak um, for her while she's out of the room, this is a woman who not only has all of this incredible expertise, um, and we talk about church humility a lot, she really doesn't see how amazing she is, but she retired from her from her job 25 years worth of working with this level of intensity of, of the subject. I mean, she must have woken up on the Monday after she retired and was like, I know what I'm going to do today. I'm going to go fix safeguarding. That's that's how incredible she is. She's a, she's a, a retired widow of many, many years. And look what this woman did. She's so good. She's so incredible. <laughs> We're singing your praises, Sarah, in case you can hear us. But um <laughs> A few, a few thoughts I have. So as you're telling this whole story, I mean, I don't know how often people in the church really kind of understand that most, if not all of the <laughs> things that have come across as far as revelation since the very beginnings were oftentimes grassroots movements and oftentimes led by women. You know, the Relief Society exists because of grassroots, you know, movements. Uh, the primary exists because of grassroots movements. So much of the race work that was done, you know, in the 70s around Blacks and the priesthood and all of those issues were grassroots movements. So I think when people have this idea that, oh, we'll wait for the revelation that somehow we'll just hit the prophet on the head and yeah. and from there we'll grow as a church. It's actually usually the other way around where we're growing as a church and the church membership moves and makes these kinds of yeah, movements, efforts, and then we see shift and change. Mm-hmm. And as you're, as you're sharing this, it, what, what I think is so incredibly painful as an advocate of change, which you're kind of talking about really well, is the pushback, right? The pushback that you get from your leaders and from your other members, you know, your friends and your community, right? So you're thinking, hello, this is going to be super common sense. I'm just going to come in here with this great idea and everybody will get behind me and everybody will think this is amazing and awesome. And then you're hit with all of this pushback and not just pushback, but like this idea that you're going not only against the community, but you're going against God, right? You're doing something sinful or bad or deceitful or mean, or, you know, so you get kind of characterized in ways that are really kind of shocking. I think sometimes when you remember the church trying to do something nice and good and and then, and then come across this. I just want to honor that and just offer that hopefully as a little bit of education for anybody who's listening. That oh, these, yeah. These are historic patterns that we've seen all along the way. Yes? They, they are, but I'm going to kind of blow your, your the audience's minds for a little minute. Yeah, we, we've had no pushback. At all. Sorry, that's not, we've had two, we've had two people messages to tell us that, that we should be listening to our leaders more. Um which we do <laughs> we, we are constantly speaking with our with our leaders um and also you know we sort of direct anyone if if you have concerns about anything we're saying or doing and especially if you're worried that we're causing harm yeah go straight to my bishop or state president please please do that because if my soul is indeed in um at, at risk then I would like to be sensible of it so thank you for being supportive but also um yeah two people which is just incredible. Now, what there is definitely an issue with is people being worried about who we hang out with and who our friends are, which is, again, something that, that we've learned from the space that, that you were in. Um, and, and that's something that, that we, this is just where we stand. Our friends ha- have got value and they are their views are reflective of the views of our families, our friends who've left the church, our friends who are nuanced and in the church. And yeah, their approaches might be difficult for you to see, but they are with us in this space. So for example, Nemo the Mormon had practically been doing secretarial duties for us <laughs> for the whole of uh, of January, um, you know, and, and which was really, really kind of them to do. They've supported us. And uh, yeah, so so we we stand with them 
in this space because I do I do worry uh, I worry a lot about them and our church is stronger with them standing with us but I guess the the thing that most people are asking us now is um well what you know why is the church doing this in the UK and not America and and I think it's because there has been a level of pushback in America the approach that we have taken has has been so different in uniting all of the voices and that sort of fearlessness of don't tell us who we get to be friends with we you know we uh, we have something to say we have professional expertise we have people telling us all across the united kingdom i've been trying to tell my state president this for years and he's worried too but he says that you know they're looking into they're going to get and actually nothing really happens so we do need people who will put their head above the parapet and tell church leaders what they actually think and yeah, I guess that might come with a risk of excommunication. But do you know what? The church, I think, has learned a lot from what happened with you, Natasha. And I hate that. I hate that it took that to learn it. But oh my goodness, it, I think we are in a much better position to talk about, especially when it's harm. Because even if the church maybe hasn't gotten it right sometimes, I, I do genuinely believe our leaders do not want to be causing harm. So there, there are things that, that we still are advocating for. We are far from being there yet. It's really exciting that the fifth Sunday is uh, is going to be devoted in UK wards to uh, telling membership about the safeguarding training. There's going to be safeguarding training where it's going to be disseminated throughout the United Kingdom. Um, we need to look at what that is. We also have concerns. We would uh, we're concerned about how the church, the process of the church helpline works, and where that sits within um, safe reporting practices. We're, we're seeing a bit of a conflict of, um, you know, do, who should we re be reporting to and when? Professionally, uh, you know, we we know you contact the police. That's that's what you do, and then anything else needs to be considered later. But there needs to be really good training around what those initial disclosures look like um and yeah so so there's tons to be done and now we're in a position where finally victims voices is going to shape what the safeguarding uh evolves into from you know from this announcement victim voices are going to and, and that's what good safeguarding is it's not just um you know here's a professional and here's someone who's super interested Good safeguarding has to be informed by the lived experience of people who have survived it. We have so many blind spots and without the voices of victims, we are never going to be able to recognise them. So yeah, this is such an exciting time. And I believe that although it's not happening in the US right now, I absolutely believe it will. So we, Sarah and I are looking at how we yeah. can rally the troops over there. You know, let's we're, we're going to be holding an event in the not too distant future to discuss it and I think the other massive thing to be borne in mind um th that we hear a lot is that the church were not compelled to do this um you may have safeguarding in your area that means you live in Canada uh, sorry not Canada uh California Australia, Australia or the Republic of Ireland you just so happen to be living somewhere where um to comply with the laws around safeguarding uh DBS checks happen that's fantastic in the UK the church has not been compelled to do this there's no legal framework to say um you know that you're going to be held to account the idea is that churches will voluntarily sign up to a code of practice and what we are really looking for the ideal is that the church will engage with third party organizations to oversee the safeguarding aspect of things um so that would include who gets to look at the dbs checks uh, if there's a problem and, and who's overseeing the decisions that are being made about risk um it would also mean that the training is is evaluated and is is held to the best possible standards it would also mean that any disclosures that happen that we are dealing with them uh with that extra element of someone who has a who has a sort of step back and i think the other thing i would say as well uh, on just on on how it's going to look is ideally 
professional standards would say that um, a safeguarding officer should be a woman uh, because there are fewer barriers to disclosing when you report to a woman that needs to be borne in mind otherwise what we're going to see is high counselors being given a job to sort of do safeguarding in their spare time um or someone who doesn't have relevant expertise also women who are disempowered because what we will see and what we have seen is sisters who'll be told thank you so much for bringing this to our attention sister you can go back to your class the priesthood holders have got it that is not what safeguarding is safeguarding has to have people who will feel empowered enough to be able to challenge what decisions are being made and can assist in the process of holding their leader to account and when we have these power dynamics that we do in the church we have to be particularly sensitive to that Right, especially since you're going to have those same power dynamics that are a bit intimidating if you have to go to a priesthood holder, and who knows if that priesthood holder has had prior callings where they, you know, where somebody may not find them approachable, right? So I think that's, yeah, that's super important. I mean, a, a few thoughts. You mentioned a while ago that the church only reported like 12 to 16 cases of sexual abuse, you know, for like 10 year, 10 year time frame and just in talking with people you had hundreds of cases is that do you think the, the church was lying or just unaware like are they just not doing their research like what is that huge discrepancy about do you have any idea maybe you can't comment on that Sarah, did you want to give that a try yeah i think we're not sure, in all honesty we're not sure what that's about there's i don't they were lying, consciously kind of lie about this. I don't think that's happening. I think confusion as to what they are counting as abuse. I think we're seeing confusion as to how that is being looked at. Are they waiting for the absolute categorical that has been a criminal conviction and the person has admitted it? Or are they looking at where people have raised concerns, where there's been reasonable allegations and reasonable room for people to ex- expect that there has been abuse and there's problems that need to be resolved so I think what is being reported how abuse is being identified are hugely problematic and need to be looked at and need to be explored much more thoroughly and that's something that we're hoping that we can be supportive with the church to do as time goes forward and I think that's where that's what it's at really I agree, Sarah, and I also think the other component of it is that how much trust do you have to have in the system, uh, being a member of the church, being in that system, to report in the first place? Because if your abuser is your family, and you know, we know that our our families and abusers are in these positions of trust, and it makes it really difficult to disclose in the first place. Now. Natasha and you know you said your your backgrounds would allow you that if a young woman for just for for example if a young woman were to talk about being in a position where they are they're pregnant you too because of your background would naturally be having conversations around consent and whether you'd be able to identify because you know the right questions to ask and you've had professional training our bishops don't you know that that these are women who are being told to go repent and having conversations that further impact to harm. So I think there's some that you're right are just not recognized. And I also think that what we're getting to see is a lack of trust in the system that people just leave. I mean, why the, I, I, I mentioned at the true. beginning, you have to really want to be Mormon here. <laughs> like you have to really, really want to be Mormon. Yeah. Um, it's so much healthier for, you know, some people to have just left and any disclosure that happens doesn't happen through the church uh, safeguarding helpline where that information is reported. So I, I think there's, a, I think it's complicated and I, but I don't, I, absolutely think they're intending to lowball the numbers no i think it's also complicated by the fact that the abuse helpline is only available at the moment to bishops and state women relief society presidents primary presidents young women's presidents were able or victims themselves were able to call the abuse helpline there might be some different discussions taking place as well so i think there's a lot of things around that that need to be explored further and better understood is the abuse helplines only for bishops and state presidents, but actually 
maybe that use could be expanded further and it could bring about a greater wealth of information. There's an awful lot, I think what Jane said is absolutely right, about how difficult it is and barriers to reporting. We have certainly heard of people who've been unable to report abuse until they're abused or they live far, far away from each other. We've heard people unable to report abuse because they were told very clearly, well, you know, that you're going to ruin his life, you're going to ruin his family's life. Leave it to God. God will deal with it in the next life. Just leave it in God's hands. And so people have felt under spiritual pressure not to take abuse matters further and not to report. And that's hugely problematic in a church that talks about, well, actually, we spend a phenomenal amount of our time in the church. Don't be talking about the next life and eternity. And sometimes I think we talk about that more than we do talk about this life. But for people that are told leave it god in its first and confidence to talk to the priesthood leaders about abuse and what's happened shame they are guilt will i be believed will i be blamed for having been in some kind of situation i shouldn't have been in all become problematic yes absolutely so my next my next question is, you know, on the one hand, you had said, well, we didn't really receive that much pushback because we only got like two, I'm guessing like members that kind of, you know, were saying you need to repent or whatever. But leading up to that, you had mentioned quite a bit of pushback from like leaders, especially when you sent this letter, right, to all the bishops. And there was like, even the church lawyers got involved and said, you know, maybe you should have done that. So, so it sounds like there's like, there's there's pushback and then there isn't pushback right so it sounds like the general membership was pretty on board like yes this is something that we're concerned about as well but it was maybe more the leadership or the structure pushback that you got that this isn't how things are done we don't have yeah a bunch of women showing up with concerns and that's how we make change in the church yeah it, it was specifically the the lawyers spot on. that we made nervous yeah yeah I think they were. I, I, what made them nervous? They were a little bit shy. We'd actually written to every bishop in the UK to explain their safeguarding responsibilities and to make sure they were fully aware that they had been named in the independent inquiry that was commissioned by the UK government, that they had been named as responsible for safeguarding. We thought well, you need to know this and you need to know that you can bring this up with your leaders if you have any questions or concerns. And I think that certainly made the leadership of the church nervous, probably because they got a lot of pushback, certainly from what we heard from bishops and state presidents that we spoke to who contacted us. Certainly, I think they, they probably got a lot of pushback from church leaders themselves over that. Yeah. I think what was fabulous to us was the way it united everybody from the ex-Mormon space to absolute strongly committed leaders within the church. It united everyone at grassroots level that safeguarding change is needed, but they were necessary and that this could happen. What I'm gathering from what she's saying, which I also had picked up on what you had said, Jane, is that this was a, a, a Mormon spectrum of people who came together, right? Which we don't have a lot of precedence for. Like, you know, it's kind of like, oh, if you're ex-Mormon, now you're kind of to be distrusted. Or, you know, if you're Mormon or LDS, then, oh, you know, you're not, it's, we can be very divisive, right? Regardless, yes. regarding our kind of um, LDS Mormon heritage, depending on our level of activity in the church, right? And there can be a lot of difficult feelings between the two groups, if you're talking about kind of, you know, active LDS people versus ex-Mormons. So the fact that this was, so, first of all, just to hear the two of you, like active members of the church speaking so lovely of your friends who have left and family members who have left and making room and space for different spiritual journeys, that's kind of just touching to hear you talk about that. But then seeing this movement being both, everybody, everybody was involved. It wasn't just ex-Mormons. It wasn't just active LDS people. It was a, a real kind of coming together because I think, you know, regardless of theology, regardless of philosophy, I think most of us um, are on board with protecting children and minors and even adults from unwanted sexual experiences and to offer them help when they do experience those kinds of things. I think that's a fairly human value that we share globally. I remember 
oh, I took a class at BYU of world religions. And then also I've just kind of talked with other kinds of um, entities that talk about, you know, like atheists and from, from atheists to the most conservative of religions, that's a pretty shared value is protection of children, right? Protection of the vulnerable within your community. So you don't need to have any necessarily moral compass to kind of have that kind of, I don't know, wound, wound in you as, as a human, if you, you know, kind of don't fall into sociopath or those kinds of perspectives, most of us share that, those values. So I, I just think that's really beautiful to hear the interconnection between so many LDS and ex-Mormon folks to come together for this grassroots movement. I think that's wonderful. I was going on the church's website uh, to kind of check uh, what they had put down. And they, of course, still very much make it very clear that the first step is to call the church's hotline. And then even under the UK, you know, it had that. And then it said UK. And then it said, you know, here's like the government agency and here's the, the background check thing. But still and foremost, the church's guideline seems to be call the hotline and and I'm I'm fairly I'm guessing you are both aware but that hotline is although not necessarily answered by lawyers sometimes there's social work people or um, mental health people that will answer it but not typically and it's run by lawyers who are I think their main goal with that hotline is to figure out what is legal in, in whatever state or country the person is calling from what are the mandates that 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 they have to do and then and then kind of give directions from there which to me is different from a mental health professional myself my first idea would be to like to take care of the victim right not to take care of like what the church has to do yes. to kind of keep their legal standing in whatever country they are being called from any thoughts from the two of you well i guess not sarah right now but from you Jane, and then <laughs> yeah i know what she's thinking <laughs> i'm ch- i'm gonna channel her yeah because well, uh, we're, we're very already, much on the yeah, same page i already see her like nodding her head several times as i'm talking so <laughs> yeah well um in america most of you guys will um i think who are listening to this will will be super aware of the links um that when you call that number it's going to Curtin mcconkey we we were really familiar with that law firm in the uk it's not Kurt McConkey, it's but it is a law firm. Um, and the because the law firm is led by one man, um, he's very well loved. Um, he's you know, pe- people are familiar with him. Uh, f- people feel very, very safe in his hands. He is a good, kind man. Um, however, I hate the safeguarding helpline I've made it really clear how I feel about the safeguarding helpline and uh, how unhelpful and how much of a barrier it can become so I don't want to sound like I'm being critical of one individual because it's different to criticize Kurt McConkey than it is to criticize the one individual who's manning a 24-hour helpline for the whole of the United Kingdom that alone is problematic the thing with the <sighs> yes Victims need to be front and centre, uh, uh, specifically is anyone in, potentially being harmed right now? Is anyone in danger right now? Um, and I, and actually, I think the lawyers and probably also Kurt McConkie there, I, I think that's pretty much what is being said. But if it doesn't seem that there's harm straight away, that so we our colleague priesthood dispatches he had made a call to the helpline he previously served as a bishop uh so he had the philosophy once a bishop always a bishop i'm going to call the helpline i'm going to see what this is like and i'm going to talk about my experience of abuse now that call he recorded he put it online it's over on his channel if anyone wants to take a look at it but it was super eye opening because we got to hear what it's like to have that call handled we uh we did a podcast about it we spoke to PD about his motivations for doing it but really interestingly the lawyer on the other side of the call left PD feeling pretty positive overall it wasn't until queen sarah here got her teeth into it and was looking at it from a professional point of view so 
um, a really pleasant experience um, from the point of view of a bishop who's being really reassured about a safeguarding concern in his area. But what didn't happen was any follow-up, was any sort of discussion around potential harm. It was centred around how the bishop is experiencing it. And in terms of is this good and effective safeguarding? Oh, hell no. Absolutely not. So, like I say, I feel like well-meaning, um, really supportive, but the church is clearly the client, and you know that that's where any legal team have to stand. Um, I, I believe these are people who try to be moral. Um, it must be extremely distressing to hear about these incidents. But are they actually helping? Are they keeping a child safe if a bishop puts a call in? Now, I do want to stress. The safeguarding helpline, the lawyer did say towards the end of that call, if you're worried right now, call uh, the emergency uh, police number. He did eventually get there. Um, but I feel like the conversation was, um, it, it wasn't structured and it wasn't one that the victims experience is first and foremost. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, that's really interesting that it's one person in that entire space that is answering these calls and yeah, lots of problems there. So we'll be very excited to talk to Sarah more about that. Okay, so we've kind of come to the end of an hour, which I mean, I feel like I could talk to you all about this for three hours straight. Easy, <laughs> easy. <laughs> but just, uh, I guess anything that I'm not asking you that you'd like to talk about or just kind of you know, giving credit where credit is due. I think, you know, we had mentioned that sometimes it, and I don't know if you want to talk about this or not, but sometimes even though it's women who kind of spearhead a lot of these efforts, sometimes it's the, it's the men who end up talking about it a lot, right? Or bring kind of, I don't know, we listen to men more, right? And sometimes that, yeah. that, that authority can kind of undermine some of the, the grassroots efforts. So anything, any last kind of thoughts that you want to bring to this topic and, and then we'll make sure and schedule a part two. Um, I guess it's because I see Sarah as as such a hero of mine that I, I mean, I've mentioned several times that I cannot think of a single example other than what perhaps Emma Smith, who, you know, brought a concern and uh, has become part of the Doctrine and Covenants and a church uh, doctrine policy was uh, was instituted based on that women haven't been able to achieve what Sarah's voice has been able to achieve um, because the information and experience that she has had has fed directly to get the information and recommendations that she's providing to the people who make decisions about it. Um, there are times as women that um, and how we express ourselves that, yeah, we, we've had to use the language of the church We've had to use the the you know the 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 real what would we call it the the real barrier that that's sort of incongruent with our characters at times that when we go into a bishop's office we want to appear non confrontational we we kind of make ourselves small and we kind of make ourselves you know deferential there is a conscious choice to do that because if we are threatening women then not just the church but no man in the planet's going to listen. So, uh, you know, anytime we use our voice anywhere, people will talk about our tone, our accent, uh, our, you know, wh whatever it is that's going to be a, a barrier to you listening to the voice of a woman. So we meet people where they are. We, we speak to them in ways that they are most comfortable with. And then we push <laughs> and then we become a bit annoying. So although it's not, um, I definitely wouldn't characterize it as pushback from leaders of the church. Yeah, they, they, it, it was fantastic for, for them to, you know, be able to clearly express, yeah, this, this um, we, we were disappointed with this. How excellent is that communication? And uh, where we were able to say, well, you know what, we're disappointed right back, pal. So <laughs> there we go. We are direct where we need to be direct because we love the people who serve in these callings. No one has achieved um, safeguarding on the level that has, it has been achieved in the UK because of the work of the safeguarding committee. That's huge. And my hope is we're going to see this evolve, reflected across the, the world, 
it can't just suddenly be dropped in someone's lap. Things are going to have to be put into place in order to make these policies happen. But we have a church membership who, when a policy drops, it will be implemented across the world. You know, there is no pushback or question there. Church members will carry that out and they will do so with their whole hearts. And we, you know, we, I think it's just recognizing that willingness to move. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel really excited about what's going to happen next. I feel really excited about the spaces that we've opened up. I feel really excited at the idea that we don't have to be fearful of um, each other and what everyone's motivation is in this space and whose agenda is is playing out because actually there hasn't been a lot of ego in this space when men are speaking about what has happened with it with these announcements they're speaking about it from their perspective it's it's how they are experiencing this what we are focusing on is how the victims who have not yet spoken out are experiencing this is this going to make church safer for you to speak now? Is this potentially going to be safeguarding at its most dangerous time when members are now overconfident that now we've really got it right and actually if anyone discloses, well, you shouldn't because now it's a lack of faith because we've got this. Um, we definitely don't yet have this. So um, we... While people are more than welcome to reach out to us and and share, especially if you're in the UK, you know we we, we find that helpful. But across the world, um, if, pe if people want to reach out to us, we will absolutely listen. We have created an anonymous reporting tool, uh, so that if people just want to sort of share their experience, um, to make it easier. Uh, if you would like to retain a level of anonymity, we do still have that open. Um. But I think what we have is a relationship of trust across the spectrum, or certainly a relationship of respect, that if there is someone who's working with a child right now in the UK, the UK and we bring a name forward, that that will be treated with respect. And I suppose the final thing that um, I just feel really strongly about right now is this is going to lead to immediate change. Uh, it's already started happening and over the next few months as these policies come into place what we're going to see is people are going to be released people are going to not be working in callings they they have done for years please 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 do not be making assumptions about why that might be you have no idea what um what background checks throw up or what they don't or uh, the conversations around someone for all sorts of reasons, might choose not to have a background check. If you don't have a background check, you're going to be disqualified from working with children and youth. And that's your right to say no to that. And, and we have to be able to protect that. Um, but there, there will be a bar. Sometimes um, our, our colleague Ruth, just uh, in a conversation with her a, a while back, we were talking about the chewed gum analogy that, that women have been taught in classes since infancy in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that um, once you cross that line or engage in a behavior, you are chewed gum, uh, that no one's going to want you now. Sometimes, just to reclaim the analogy in the words of Ruth, sometimes the bishop is going to be the chewed gum. Sometimes you will have engaged in an action that no matter what has happened next, no matter what that repentance process has looked like, it will completely disqualify you from service in a leadership position or certainly working with anybody who's vulnerable for the rest of your life because there are consequences. And we're going to have to see some accountability for that. And that has to be that has to be taken on board. There's going to have to be additional pastoral care. But what we need to not do is make assumptions that if someone is no longer serving within a certain calling, it means that they have a potential background of child abuse. Because realistically, it's probably not been that. Um, but yeah, so I think training has to help prepare members for being really uncomfortable and uh, 
yeah, I, I, I'm going to be really interested to see where that takes the church. It's going to not only make it a safer place, but it's ideally going to make it a healthier place because now we will have to have those discussions. Yes, and I hope that people who work with children and minors in the church includes bishops and state presidents and it even council members. Mm-hmm. And because it's, you know, whether it's interviews or going to their homes or, you know, ministering to them in any way, you know, way or form, those are all roles that that do include visiting with youth. I also kind of, to your point, agree, yes, not all background checks are about sexual abuse. Even when they are, not all people who have perpetrated or done something incorrectly are still dangers to society. And there are plenty of people out there who have not been, you know, through the system that are that are dangers to our society. And so, yeah, by no means should this be like, oh, good, we have this in place. Now we can just relax. You know, it's it's an ongoing process of of safeguarding children, adolescents and and vulnerable adults for sure. So thank you for that reminder. I just I just want to say thank you so much, both of you, for all the work, all the efforts that you've done. Um, I know there's lots of people who have attempted this kind of work in the past, you know, from I think you had mentioned the September 6th, you know, and (laughs) way back when that um, several of them were kind of talking about these kinds of issues as well. Um, I know Chico Kazaki, you know, did phenomenal work in our church as a leader, as a female leader in regards to bringing attention to abuse issues. And then, of course, there's a lot of people who have been either disciplined or, you know, ousted or um told to be quiet whether they're victims or advocates so this is not a this is not a great part of our history it it usually isn't part of anybody's good history in any community it's something that we all need to treat differently and and go forward in in much more kind of savvy and kind of um, informed ways with what we have available to us today so i just i can't thank you enough for your efforts and like i said if if we could do a part two where we could bring in primarily Sarah, but also, you know, Jane, if you're willing to sh- to kind of be the, the background voice for that interview, that would be great because I, I would really like to talk to Sarah in particular. Um, yeah. Her background as a social worker and so interesting that you worked both with sexual victims and sexual predators and also a probationary um, kind of role in your community. So that's a lot of richness and I'm so glad that they were able to listen to everything you had to bring to the table. So... Thank you so much, UK sisters. You rock. <laughs> Thank you so much. We we yeah. really appreciate you and all that you've done, all that you've done. Oh, thank you. And I'm going to link to all the things that you've been mentioning, you know, as far as your podcast and the surveys and the, you know, questionnaires and where p- places where people can tell their story if they feel so inclined. So I'll link to all of that as well. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Well, your afternoon or evening. So thank you. Uh, Early evening. Thank you so much. Have a good night. (laughs) All right. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Natasha Helfer Podcast. To help keep this podcast going, please consider donating at natashahelfer.com and share this episode. To watch the video of this podcast, you can subscribe to Natasha's channel on YouTube and follow her professional Facebook page at Natasha Helfer, LCMFT, CST-S. You can find all her cool resources at natashahelfer.com. The intro and outro music for these episodes are by Otter Creek. There is a place where time slows to nature's pace and there is space there to find yourself in her embrace. Some places should be left alone so we can always go to the homeland of the heart and of our human history etched on her canyon walls alongside Earth's mysteries some